Primarily because um, I just had the sense of seeing what was happening over the last months. I've been following this from afar. And in talking to some of the media people through social media, I just really had a sense that what you guys were seeing was what I saw 25 years ago when the Jack in the Box case happened. And being here today sort of confirms that. And then also, um, I knew enough about the legal system here to know that um, there was a way for many of these people who are sickened and hurt to get some form of justice and compensation. So I came here and I've met with some of the lawyers who may well be handling the cases. Um, they don't know how to do this, um, but I certainly have been doing this for 25 years. I know what I'm doing. It's always um, difficult when you overlay a tragedy like this with legal stuff. Um, but in my experience, the things that have moved the needle in food safety have been the stories of the victims. And there's nothing quite like a legal proceeding that has you know, sort of a beginning, a middle, and an end that helps tell a victim's story. And so there are a lot of those stories, some of them we heard today, mm -hmm. but there are gonna be some real tragic stories. Um, there are going to be you know, children who are born prematurely who will need a lifetime of care of, and who are, have, were born with compromised systems and you know, will need you know, assistance throughout the rest of their lives. And that's not something that a family should be solely responsible for. So, you know, to the, to the extent I can help sort of help the lawyers do the right thing, um, I'm more than willing to help. It's really the same advice I would give, you know, any business person um, who's running a company, a food company, is that um, small, medium, or large. Um, and it's somewhat easier to translate into a large company because usually a large company has the financial resources to do stuff. But even small companies uh, need to pay attention to details. And I think large companies do as well. Um, having people that are committed to food safety, and whether that's you know, your chef the, in, a, in a, it's a small mom and pop restaurant, or you're a multi-billion dollar manufacturing facility, you know, have the people that are available to, to learn from, you know, use consultants, use the government, use the resources that are available. Because in my experience, um, all of these outbreaks that I've been involved in the last 25 years, every single one of them could be prevented. It just didn't just happen. They were, there were failures in the system and usually failures of people to pay attention to things that were right in front of them. So the bottom line, the advice is have the people available to you, the consultants, the staff, the government officials, have those people available to you to help make sure that you're paying attention to the things that matter. It's, it's a constant thing I see. I mean, I, I speak at you know, two or three conferences a month all over the country and all over the world. Um, and uh, I can't tell you how many times a manager has come up to me, you know, looking around to make sure no one's watching, and then goes, my man, you know, my own, the owner won't pay attention to us. We need this, and they won't do that. And, you know, I can guarantee you that every company that I've sued wishes that they had been paying attention to details. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's a hard thing to do because um, you can do everything right and still a bad thing can happen. But there are a lot of companies that are doing it right and paying attention to details that have never caused an outbreak mm -hmm. and I've never sued them. One of the things that's really, really interesting is um, there are bits and pieces of what I've learned over the last few months and today about how much more advanced South Africa is 
to, to deal with a crisis like a, the jack-in-the-box that the U.S. dealt with in 1993, and we were not as far along, candidly, in the science um, and not as far along in the ability to have lots of resources um, because a lot of it was unknown. Here, you know, you're doing whole genome sequencing. That, the fact that you're able to link an outbreak that is definitively scientifically proven really allows not just the company that this impacted, but everyone to believe that the thing happened so that it's not fake news. And you can learn from that and move forward with all of the things that were talked about today at the conference. I mean, you know, uh, all of the technologies that are available for food safety, whether it be chemicals or education, all of those things are how you're going to prevent the next outbreak. But I think Africa has, is farther ahead and has all the basis to create a situ situation and a, and a food safety culture that's going to work. I would not be surprised that um, people will break into camps. You'll have the industry people, you'll have the government people, you'll have the food safety people, you'll have the victims, you'll have the lawyers, and everybody will be pointing fingers at each other and, and not communicating. Um, that's really the wrong thing to do. Um, you know, the focus should be on sort of bringing people together. And I don't know if there is a trusted body of some sort or a trusted person that, or, or a, maybe an educational institution that can sort of bring those people together to have the kind of discussion that recognizes that mistakes were made, maybe on the government's part, uh, on the industry's part, and what consumers need to know, but to sort of have that discussion, have it open, and then have, like, from that, what are the things we need to do? Um, you know, I learned today that uh, although this outbreak's been going on for a long period of time, it wasn't until December that Listeria was uh, a reportable disease. Well, you figured out the outbreak pretty quickly after that. So just looking at that as something that clearly should have happened a year ago or two years ago, but then we're going to get into knowing about exactly what was going on in that plant. We'll, we'll learn that perhaps through litigation, perhaps through a criminal investigation. And that's going to be painful. But from that, that company obviously is going to learn some tar hard lessons. But other companies can learn how to not get in that situation again. So I'm actually optimistic that um, but there's got to be some coalition, coalition. there's got to be some way to get those people to communicate before they sort of scatter into their camps and, you know, take their toys and go home. So a, a lot of outbreaks that I've been involved in, um, it, it's, a, it's a problem with the product that came in that was then manufactured and then shipped out, contaminated. And there was, in many of the outbreaks, there's sort of a lack of quality assurance from that supplier that you're so focused on getting the ingredient that you're not necessarily focused on how that ingredient is getting to you. And, and have you ever visited that individual? Or do you know really what kinds of audits they've had? A lot of times in the U.S., and it may or may not be the case here, a lot of times a, a large grocery store will have a contract with the supplier uh, the, or the manufacturer of a product that says, if something bad happens, it's your problem. And then that manufacturer will turn to the supply chain and said, if you send me bad product, it's your problem. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is if that supplied product causes an enormous outbreak, that small grower or shipper isn't going to have enough money to cover it. Then 
the manufacturer is going to have to deal with it, and that manufacturer may not have enough money to deal with it, and then the retailer is going to have to deal with it. So my point of sort of making that supply chain transparent and knowing, having a relationship with those people is really the way of preventing a foodborne illness to occur and for sort of disaster to strike the entire supply chain. I think that's probably a good chance. Let's see what happens. I'll see what happens. But um, you know, I'm. I'm. Uh, this is one of those kinds of cases that. Um, you know, I have the experience to help people do it. Whatever exactly how it works out, mm -hmm. on you know, from a business side, is it's not really very relevant to me. Mm -hmm. But it, from a point of view of you know, being able to help the victims and to maybe always be like a, a you know, some, a, some in somebody's ear going, you know, it might be a good idea for you to talk to this person. Mm -hmm. Because the one good thing about litigation and lawsuits is once you're in a courtroom scenario, you can compel people to show up. Yeah. And so that, there's nothing like a good compelling somebody to show up and talk to you to sort of bring you in. And, you know, many of the people that I've spent the most time deposing over the years have become my friends slash frenemies. I think the only thing that, and, you know, uh, the, some of the reporters, you know, I think are going to work on that is, you know, what's missing right now is some of the faces of some of these people. And I think, um, you know, once that, once that happens, once people can say, boy, that reminds me of my mom, or might reminds me of my kid, or my wife's pregnant too, and look what happened to this person. I think once that happens, then there's a little more pressure on the government to act, both from a financial point of view to you know, maybe do more testing and, and more visits. Um, the companies start thinking that it's a better idea to you know, bring in people that know what they're doing to advise them on what they should be doing. Um, and, it, you know, and having victims come forward with litigation empowers consumers. Mm -hmm. And it's empowered consumers that ultimately change people's behavior. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic about the process and, you know, I, I'm expecting to, you know, take that 20-hour flight more than a few more times.